What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Sharp Objects Companion Podcast. This is the final episode of this series. Uh, for those who have been listening you know, on a week-by-week -week basis, uh, you know that I've been in Norway, Denmark. I've been traveling all over the place, so I missed an episode. So this episode will actually be episode 7 and episode 8, the season finale. Uh, series finale? I don't know. We'll see on that, by the way. I've, I've mentioned this before, but Big Little Lies is also a limited series. We're just doing one season of it. Obviously, that's not true. Now they're coming back for a second season. It's even the same... You know, same network, HBO, same uh, show creator, everything. So is this a limited series for now? Yes. Will it become a season two down the road? I mean, I haven't heard anything, so I don't think so, but you never know. Now, season one is based on the book, but I'm pretty sure Big Little Lies was in a similar situation. So regardless, this is the end of season one, possibly the whole show, and we're doing the last two episodes as a little package deal. Now, in case you are you know, either going back and listening to this in the past or or future, I guess. This is the past. You're listening to the future. Uh, whether you're doing that and want to go episode by episode by episode, or if you just haven't got to the finale yet, or you just want to hear an individual episode breakdown, I'm going to do that. So I'll start by just talking about episode seven. I wrote these notes before I finished the show, before I watched the, the final episode. So it's all relevant in context of that. So if you're listening to the first half of this, and I'll make it very clear, that's episode seven. You can pause it. I'll give you a warning. You can pause it and, and watch episode eight before moving on. Or if you are all caught up, I don't know. You can listen to both of them at the same time. So that's how we're doing this. But it's all one episode, obviously. So starting with episode seven, entitled Falling. First of all, and I feel like a broken record because I've said this a million times. It's becoming redundant. But this show is just... It, it's so chilling. You know, it just keeps hitting me. I, I feel bad for repeating myself. But it's like, as, as soon as I'm like... feel like I'm settling into something, all of a sudden, uh, it'll hit me again where I'm like, shit, man, this is this is just a scary show. It's just scary. The, the vibe of it, uh, obviously, the elements... You know, they go into the actual, it's about child murders, right? So it's going to be creepy, but just the way it's shot, the colors, the acting, the the pacing, everything about it's so just chilling, man. I don't know how else to say it. And the opening of episode seven was, you know, a perfect element of, of that sort of scary creepiness that's persisted throughout this entire show, basically, so far. Um, you know, with the, the dream about the dollhouse. I know we're going back in time, potentially, so... I'll try, try my best to remind you, give you context, depending on when you're listening to this. But it starts with Camille having the dream about the dollhouse where she's you know, looking through and then in complete silence, the whole thing, the, the volume on the whole scene is turned down. In complete silence is that sudden sight of a figure moving past the window and it kind of scares her awake. But most importantly, it does this without like a bang sound. You know how you're watching horror movies nowadays and you'll hear like, you know, the, the, you'll hear the music, like the string instruments get higher and higher and more tense. And then as soon as something jumps out, like someone walking past the window or something, you'll hear like a Dun! like some like big noise that's supposed to like make you jump. You know, that that's kind of the recipe for horror movies nowadays and and it's kind of dumb because it's on one hand you are the visual element has something to do with it, but it, it, for the most part if I'm walking on the sidewalk and someone makes a giant bang sound behind me, it's going to scare me then too and it's not because of the writing or the build up or or any sort of, you know, suspense or anything like that. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's cool, it's also kind of lazy. It's effective, but lazy. I, lazy is the best way to describe it. Uh, what this show does instead, it has like this unspoken scare factor. Like when she, when the, the, the figure in the dollhouse walks past the window, which is very creepy, right? And it scares Camille awake. She's having a nightmare that scares her awake. When that happens, you just, you, you get scared by the visual. They don't have any sound that makes you jump or anything like that. It's just the visual of it, which is such just brilliant writing. And, and you know, when you get used to it, first of all, I've said this throughout this entire season, but you can't look away from the screen cause you're going to miss something. And it's because they don't have these. Uh, you know, audio cues. And, and that's difficult at times, but it forces you to actually pay attention to the show. God forbid, you can't just skim through this one. You're at, you actually have to pay attention to the show scene by scene and you get these really big payoffs and, and just really, you know, well-written creepiness, if that makes sense. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just brilliant. And I, I even got past the first scene of episode seven. I've been rambling about it. That's just how good I feel about this show. But let's get to some raw details now. So we finally got some context on what happened to... Camille's sister when they were kids, not not Emma, uh, Marion when they were kids, the sister that died of, of being sick. We find out, you know, according to a the nurse that treated her, and this is pretty much confirmed, so we can just talk about this now. Uh, that Marion was a victim of Munchausen Munchausen by proxy syndrome or MVP. I actually, by the way, fun fact, know about this because of Eminem lyrics. I don't know how many other people feel that way, but he literally talks about it in cleaning out my closet. Um, his mom w had this sickness or whatever. So it was literally making him and his little brother, who I think is technically his nephew or uncle or some weird relationship there. But, um, 
the mom was literally making that person sick because she had this the sickness. So that's how I knew about this. It's also, if you've ever watched Sixth Sense, this is what happens to Misha Martin's character. Spoiler alert. Uh, I don't know. Whatever. That, that movie came out a long time ago. I don't feel bad about that. So we're keeping it in there. Um, but yeah, so Adora has this, and that's what killed Marion. And it seems like she's doing the same thing to Emma now, and Camille is trying to save her. Right? Like, she's like, oh, Emma, you're sick. Drink this. Drink this. And Emma's getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And it's kind of a, a cyclical thing. This is what was going on with Marion, and now it's happening to Emma. Now, sticking to this, it was very interesting to see what happened when Emma turned down the medicine from her mother. So Camille basically talks to her about it or whatever, or makes her, she's like, I always refuse to take this stuff. I was always difficult or however that conversation went. And Emma, uh, you know, whether it was because of the influence of her big sister or whatever, Emma basically refused the medicine. And if you see the mother, because it wasn't, it wasn't like you refused it and the mother's like, take your medicine and went like super aggressive. It was this passive aggressive chirpiness. It, it was, it was a series of, you know, guilt tripping comments and things like that. And that's how... She sort of manipulated Emma without being forceful or, or even, you know, admitting guilt. Like, it wasn't obvious that she was doing anything wrong. It was like, you know, if you don't want me to take care of you, obviously you're too mature for this and this. And she was being passive aggressive, but it was almost a more manipulating way to go about things. And you kind of see how Adora has been this mastermind, like puppet master in, in all of her kids' lives, really. Uh, you know, we see that Camille is more resistant with it and, and it's kind of pulled away instead of just subduing to it. But obviously she has a huge effect on Camille's life as well and Camille's outlook and all this stuff. So uh, it was really, really kind of disturbing to see her do that. And speaking of disturbing, one of the most disturbing lines I've heard in this show, which is saying something, is when Emma says, uh, you know, in relation to Marion, she's like, I I'm not as good. I can never be good as someone dead, which is so creepy. And I feel like that sentiment has been repeated throughout the show as well, where, where you know, this idea of, when you die, you're perfect. You can't ever be as good as someone who's dead because, you know, people, the way people talk about people who are dead or, the, you know, they're perfect. Doesn't matter what they did in their life. They're perfect angels. It's a tragedy that they're gone. You know, it, you basically sugarcoat someone's life and just talk about the good things because that's what we do to like honor the dead. But when you have someone like uh, Emma, who's obviously got some dark darkness to her personality, you know, you, you she looks at death through that scope and, and it almost gets jealous of the dead because the dead are, are, are perfect and, you know she strives to be perfect she's like competing with the dead which is such a twisted way to think about it but it's clearly this is how she processes these thoughts in her head and it's perfectly summed up in a line that's you know it's haunting as that one once again not to the writers of the show it's brilliant and then how about the father going back and listening to music and, and being willfully ignorant of the whole thing so when he's listening to his music i feel like you get the vibe that there's something wrong something weird about that because we've seen that throughout the season as well but now we get to see exactly why we have that gut reaction and the reason is because his listen to that music is him being willfully ignorant of the mother basically killing kids under his roof. You know what I mean? That's almost as bad as what Adora is doing. You could even make the argument that it's worse because by definition, Adora is mentally ill, right? So if she's mentally ill, then, you know, in some way she's a victim of that. If, if you, if that's how you view mental illness, then it's, it's no different than being mad at someone for having cancer, right? So if she's mentally ill and that's why she's doing this to her kids then the father not being mentally ill, making the, the decision basically to let it happen, you can make the argument that that's worse. And then on the flip side, you got Jackie, the, the town drunk and gossip and whatever. And she knew the whole time too, which is what drove her to alcoholism and, and, and all this other stuff, which once again, is that not, is that not just as bad or, or worse than what Adora is doing? When you watch one kid die and you see her doing it to another one, Emma, you know, I could see if, if it's like, well, too late, you know, Camille got out of there, one kid died and, and no one's going to believe me. But when she's doing it to another kid, that adds another level of, of evil, basically, to not speak out about it. So it's, it's really kind of disturbing to see how the actions of this, this woman, Adora, has affected the town and everyone else around her and even her own husband and all this stuff. I guess that goes to the point of Wind Gap just being like a shit show of a place, you know, like everybody's, everyone's messed up in Wind Gap, basically. And of course, for the first time, we see Adora as a predator. And it's implied that she's the one who murdered those kids. You know, Emma is, is literally throwing up pieces of herself. Like, that was really particularly disgusting, too. If you're looking at the, the bowl when she's literally throwing up, you know, pieces of, I don't even know, her stomach or stomach lining. I don't, I don't know. But clearly, she's being poisoned and throwing up pieces of herself. And that is proceeded by maybe the most disturbing line of the show, to me anyway. Just the, the, where, it, where they place the line in the show and, and how it hit. When Adora, they show a flashback of her holding baby Emma. You know, you, you find out that she's the one that killed Marion with this basic, uh, this poisoning of her daughter to make her feel like she was sick. This whole Munchausen by proxy syndrome. So we see that play out. And then you see her holding baby Emma. And she says the line, 
sadly too. She says, God has given me another sick baby, like all sad. But you know that that's just her mental illness. Once again, immediately with an infant going towards, oh no, she's sick too. I gotta, I gotta take care of her. And she's going to poison this kid as well. And it's so creepy. That was such a jarring line to hear. And then moving on to the you know second half, I don't know exactly what the timing is, but more or less the second half of the episode, uh, sticking to my recurring theme of criticizing and, and sometimes occasionally praising the whiskey drinking on this show. Uh, Jackie, by the way, she knew what she was doing, but I got super triggered by John Keane not finishing his shot. I mean, I, I, I knew he was guilty right there and then. I'm kidding, obviously, but it really was like uh, he has to have some skeletons in his closet. You don't do a shot with someone, especially that situation where he's like, I'm getting messed up. I'm going to go to jail, man. And he's trying to get drunk and he did that shot and he barely, I saw because Camille like, threw it back. He didn't really throw it back. And then I look and sure enough, half the shot was still in the glass. It was very disturbing to me. This is clearly, you know, sociopathic behavior. Is sociopathic a word? I don't know, but he's a sociopath. He must be. It was an absolute bonkers move. That, to me, was way more damning than his, his little hypothetical conversation about, quote, this is how I would have done it. You know, like that bullshit, like when, when O.J. Simpson wrote his book about, I didn't kill her, but here's every detail that explains how I could have. Like when he was doing that sort of game, when he was like, I could tell stories too in the bar, some would find that, you know, somewhat damning and make him feel guilty. In my opinion, that was far less damning than him only doing half a shot. That was just weird. Weird guy. And by the way, the sex scene with John Keene, it was particularly jarring to a friend of mine who texted me. Uh, she said, so I'm just getting caught up with sharp objects. She has sex with the teenager appalled, which I thought was funny because obviously it's, I read the book. I, I knew these things were coming. Uh, it was just funny to see someone else's you know, reaction to that. But I will say it actually made a lot more sense than it at, at first appeared, at least to her. And I'm assuming a lot of other people were kind of surprised by that. Maybe they did a better, better job of providing context in the book, but you can kind of make these these leaps in logic yourself as well. But uh, I mean, they're both broken people, right? They both have these unearned and unwanted reputations as being monsters or being bad people. And they're really not. They're just, you know, you have Camille who lost her sister because of this disease and you have John Keene who lost his sister because of this murder, uh, whether you believe he did it or not. And it would make sense that in that moment, they would find each other and just have this moment, right? Like he, he wasn't afraid to see her scars because basically he feels the same way. I'm sure he's thought about doing maybe not that because that's very specific and, and almost like creative in a way. But, you know, he's talking about hurting himself. He, he was talking about, you know, just driving into a lake or killing himself and whatever. So obviously the emotions that drove Camille to do this to her own body, John Keane does understand those. He was saying like, I, I, I see you, let me see you, whatever. And that makes sense to, to have these two sort of lost, broken souls find each other. So it did make sense in context. And as they mentioned, he was 18. So it wasn't a, a pedophile thing. But it does do wonders in disproving the whole John Keene is a creepy pedophile thing. Because although the two little girls in the show weren't you know, sexually assaulted, it, it did seem like there was a creepiness to it, right? Like there's a, a really weird you know, element. We, we never get like de murdered young girls like that's what you go to is like oh it must be some pervert rolling through town and i think a lot of the rumors were john Keene is a pervert and that almost tied into him not having sex with his girlfriend as well but obviously this disproves both those things because for one camille is obviously an older woman not even a woman his age is an older woman so clearly i mean i guess i don't really know the ins and outs of the pedophile world but i assume that that if you're crazy about these young girls you're not gonna pursue a woman that's older than you as well but I don't know. So I feel like it, in one way, it kind of steers clear of that theory that John Keane's a pervert. And then it also explains the whole thing about him not having sex with his girlfriend. It's not because he's into kids or some weird shit like that. It's because he's broken and, and kind of turned off by people who don't get that. Like, obviously, his girlfriend w was Miss Perfect and the cheerleader and had her image to uphold and just wanted to get her name in the paper. Whereas Camille is much more similar to him and somebody that he can connect to. And that's why they ended up together, not because... Of, of anything else besides that. So there's no... I feel like a lot of people saw it as kind of a red flag that he wasn't hooking up with his girlfriend, but it seems like maybe it wasn't. That could have been a false lead of sorts. But this episode basically ends with Camille thinking that Adora killed the little girls, you know, just like she at least effectively killed Marion and is currently killing Emma. You know, she's she's doing this thing to Emma that she did to Marion that led to Marion's death and, and two other dead little girls show up around town. Adora killed one of them, right? So why wouldn't she have killed the other two? So Camille's basically convinced that Adora did it, and that's how the episode ends. So on to the series finale. Now, if you're listening to this in two chunks, as I mentioned before, feel free to pause it here, watch the finale before listening to the rest of the episode, because from here on, I'm going to be doing a whole bunch of finale spoilers, obviously. So yeah, this is your warning. Ready? On to the finale. Here we go. All right. So I wanted to start with a long opening scene at the dinner table. It was so tense. 
Like the show does such a good job, whether it's, it's the writing or the way it's shot. I give it a lot of credit to the directing early on. And I still feel that way. The, the, the way the show is directed is brilliant. I mean, this director is unbelievable. Same guy did big little lies. He's unbelievable. So no surprise there, but that's the scene when they're, they're talking at the dinner table and Camille's kind of glaring at her mom and you have Emma who's sick and the dad's just like nonchalant talking about death. They're talking about dark stuff, but in like a, oh, like laughy, like, you know, rich kind of bougie way. And it's so, it's just so weird and jarring to see. And so intense. They actually, it, you know what it reminded me of ironically enough too, it reminded me of that milk scene in the beginning of Inglorious Bastards. Now, obviously, the name of this episode is Milk. I'm sure that's unrelated, but that's what that reminded me of that the tense scene where the people are under the the floorboards and you know the the Jew hunter is going around talking to to the the you know the farming family. If you've seen the show, seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. The very first scene in Inglorious Bastards, all where they're talking about basically milk, but you feel this tension because you understand the circumstances, you know what's at stake, and it's so just just intense to the point where like it's almost uncomfortable to watch. I feel like that's what this was because you know. They're just having a conversation around dinner, but you know there's more going on because we understand the context of, of the relationship between the the characters and where everyone stands, and you know the information that Camille just learned that maybe not only did Adora now she finally knows that Adora is making her kids sick, but maybe she also killed these other girls too. So that you have this really crazy scene. I thought that was uh, pretty memorable. And then of course that ends with Camille basically hatching this plan to self sacrifice. I guess, in, in order to get people to finally see what her mother did to her and her sisters. I had some questions about this. Because one, isn't there like a better way to handle it? Maybe like, couldn't you have just been like, gone to the detective and been like, oh, look, I know what she did. I think maybe the thought was, one, I don't know if Camille was brave enough to actually confront her mother, like straight on. Because I, I don't think that's how Adora would have done it. I think, I think that passive aggressiveness is kind of a character trait within the family. So perhaps that was part of that, like... Instead of just going to the police and, and ratting out the mother, maybe she felt more comfortable doing it this way. Also, maybe they wouldn't believe Adora. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, Camille just got caught in the room with John Keane. She's an alcoholic. She's got all these, these problems. You know, look at her body. She's cut herself up. She's, she's mentally ill, you could say. And documented as well. Like, Adora's not documented as being mentally ill, but Camille is, right? She's gone to the psych hospital and all this stuff. So if she comes out with this accusation, what are the odds anyone actually believes her? So that's an interesting question as well. But anyway, her plan ends up being, you know, she, she fakes an illness, I think is what she was doing, faking it, letting the mom take care of her, saying, I want more medicine, mom, I want more medicine, and basically just drinking so much she's basically on death's door. And she gets Emma's attention and she says, first of all, I think part of it's to distract from Emma, so Emma doesn't have to have more medicine. She's trying to save her sister. But the other part of it is, you know, I'm sick. And she tells Emma to go get the detective and bring him up here. Like, let him see what, what our mother does to us. And then that'll be how we finally catch her and get her in trouble. We'll catch her red-handed, basically. Now, this scene was extremely well acted by both girls. I felt like I was trapped in that, inside that house. I felt like I was sick and sluggish and getting poisoned. Like, I, I almost felt it when I was watching it. For real. Like, I felt nauseous watching it. Not just because it was gross. Watch people throw up over and over again. But the way it was shot and the sweat and like the just glazed over eyes, like I don't know, it was very believable. And that was pretty disturbing to to watch that, you know. And of course, it, it points to the fact that you know abuse is cyclical as abuse often is, because we learned that uh, Adora's mother uh, abused her, as evident by that wood story, right? She just drove over to the woods and dropped off in the woods, and, and I think I heard. I think it was Alan halfway through the season kind of alluded to that too. Like, you don't know how hard Adora's mother was on her. So Adora was abused and now Adora is abusing her kids. And then the final piece of the puzzle is how these kids respond, how Camille responds, how Emma responds. We'll obviously get back to that. I think you know where I'm going with this, assuming you've watched the finale, but um, yeah. So it is very interesting to see the cyclical, cyclical cycle, repetitive cycle. I don't know. Just to see... The, the history repeat itself over and over again from generation to generation with this pattern of abuse. So I, I still think that the parts of the show that really stand out to me the most are the classic horror elements. I do like all this deep seated emotional, uh, you know, complex creepiness and, and just dark storylines and all that. I like that stuff too. I, I really do. But the parts that stand out to me because it's within this context, it's not a horror movie. It's in the context of this deep, deep drama, this heavy drama, you still get these classic horror elements. Like, like the ghostly images of Marion haunting the house. I've mentioned that a few times. You know, it'll be subtle. You'll just see her in the corner or up, you know, on the second floor looking over the banister or whatever. You'll see these subtle sort of ghostly images and they're quick and they're fast and they're understated and that makes them extra scary, in my opinion. Or, and this is why I bring this up, the scene in this episode with Emma saying, 
because basically, she, you know, Camille tells Emma to go get help, tell the detective about what's happening. We're going to catch mom red-handed, basically. And Emma's response, she sees her by the dollhouse, and she's like, you know, Emma, wh- I told you to go. And she says, I'm, I'm sorry. I need to stay her good girl. While sitting in front of a dollhouse, first of all, and this is a combination of both things, it had the emotional power of a really good drama, right? Because it was a, a plot twist. It was a, an obstacle, and you're like, oh, shoot, we're this close to to having our plan come true and, and something got in the way. So it has like that, you know, good dramatic element to it, but it also has a straight up scariness of a creepy horror movie scene. Like seeing her dressed in her nightgown at the, the dollhouse looking like a child, but like she's poisoned and, and you know, she, she's clearly brainwashed or manipulated by her mom. She says, I'm sorry. I need to stay her good girl. Wicked scary. I thought that was terrifying. So I, I always like how this, the show was able to mix those horror elements in without feeling like American Horror Story, without feeling like, you know, whatever, Castle Rock. Or, or, and I like, I like, well, American Horror Story has been hit or miss, but I like Castle Rock. I, I like these horror shows. I'm not against them. But to have elements of that in a show that is very clearly drama first, horror second, is just impressive to me. It's just good writing. But enough about that. Let's move on to some of the more raw points of this episode, the actual details and, and plot points and things like that. We spent about half the episode... The same way we spent most of episode seven, thinking that Adora is the killer, right? We had uh, even a false ending. I said, I said first half of the episode. I should take that back. It was the entire episode we thought that Adora was the killer. We even had this false ending with about, I mean, even like to the last like two minutes or a minute of the show. It's it's the last the last possible scenes. You finally get the, get this reveal. But they have Camille and Emma. They're back in St. Louis. They seem happy. They're finally free from the abusive tyranny of Adora. They find the pliers in the kitchen. So clearly Adora did it. It all comes full circle. And it seems like Camille is rescuing her sister. And it's all good. It's almost a happy ending. Do you know what I mean? But of course, she wasn't the killer after all. It was Emma. So, so this is the part I remember from the book. And I've basically known this all along. Now, I couldn't remember how the, the pieces shook out with Adora and John Keane and all that. But the one detail I did remember was the teeth in the dollhouse from you know i read the book three four years ago i remember the teeth in the dollhouse i remember that emma did it she's the one that killed the little girls i couldn't remember anything else about it and by the way if memory serves me correctly which granted like i said it was a few years ago uh i think they wrote it a little differently for the show by making it the very last thing you see before the final credits i feel like in the book they tell you earlier you figure it out earlier and then there's a whole wrap up after that this time obviously it literally ends with her saying don't tell mama well that and we get the the quick cut of Emma killing everyone including her new friend in St. Louis it would appear that's kind of quick and subtle but it seems like she killed her too so so we get more context on that you know whatever 10 seconds into the credits rolling that they cut to that but it was still a lot more abrupt than I remember in the book and I actually think that was a good choice it made it sort of that that the perfect unspoken subtlety that we've seen throughout the show you know I, I actually think I liked it more because that really gave the show its distinct feel, you know, that subtlety. And to end it on that same note, I thought was just just good. It was a, a good, you know, sort of closed loop, poetic ending to the show. And I, I really did like that. Uh, but yeah, it was Emma. Surprised? By the way, I, I would like to talk to someone who hadn't read the book and see, uh, you know, how effective the show was at sneaking that reveal in there. Because obviously I knew it, so didn't sneak up on me because I, I knew it going in but i wonder if you did not read the book you know was it sneaky was it obvious did you know it was Amber the whole time did you think it was somebody else uh did you think it was adora and and them arresting adora kind of confirmed it for you i'm curious so i'll have to ask around about that but uh but yeah and of course th- there is the moral question here as well right because uh adora you know she might not have killed those girls Emma killed the girls it wasn't adora but adora isn't exactly guilt-free either right is is this just another case of the cycle of mental illness? You know, the the mother was abusive or mentally ill. You could say Adora was mentally ill, and now Emma's mentally ill. Is it the cycle of that, or is this a direct result of Adora choosing to abuse her daughter and ultimately creating this murderous monster? Right, because if that's the case, then you can make the argument that that Adora's at least an accomplice or, or partially responsible for these girls murders as well, even though she might not have been the one that actually did it because she created the monster that is Emma. Right. So that's just an interesting moral dilemma. You know, is the mother at fault. And I guess by proxy, do you feel like she deserves to get thrown in jail for the murders of these kids? Because even though she didn't do it, Emma did Adora is still kind of a monster too. Right. And it seems like it's kind of proven that she she did the whole uh, Munchausen thing. So it seems like she'll get busted for that regardless. But she proved she she pleaded not guilty to the murder of the daughters. So I guess we don't know how that's going to end. 
with the court case and all that which by the way potential open-ended for a season two i don't know if there's enough there like what are you gonna do a court courtroom drama i'm not sure about that but uh yeah definitely interesting and finally i want to end with a quote from camille's article because it was brilliantly written and let me just say uh i feel like people forget this a lot when you're reading like camille wrote that article right so uh, it was her piece for the newspaper or the website or whatever she was writing writing for you know she went to the town to do the piece uh on these murders and she ends up writing it and the editor is reading her writing out loud it's important to keep in mind that someone actually wrote that right it's not like oh yeah you just grabbed an article no no no. someone one of the people who writes for the show had to write an article within the show so if it's a well-written article i mean granted you have all the time in the world you're creating your own reality but it's a really impressive thing when that happens it's actually the reason why stand-up comedy doesn't work a lot in stand-up comedy shows a lot of tv shows that are scripted based on stand-up and when you see the comic tell jokes, a lot of times they're not funny because you're not getting an actual stand-up comic writing those jokes. You're getting like a screenplay writer or whatever, right? So you can't really capture it. That's why this is impressive because this is... Granted, it's a writer writing about writing. I know that was a tongue twister, but you know what I mean? Like, I, I understand that's not a huge leap to write uh, an op-ed type deal uh, within a show. But it's still... I, I thought it was really well written. So I wanted to acknowledge it and end with this quote because I think it sums things up nicely. Uh, This is from Adora's article within the show. She says, Am I good at caring for Emma because of kindness? Or do I like caring for Emma because I have Adora's sickness? I waver between the two, especially at night when my skin begins to pulse. Now, that was just really interesting to me because it it does really kind of sum things up, doesn't it? Are we making our own decisions or are we the product of our genetics and our upbringing and and things like that? You know, is it it all nature and nurture? People talk about nature versus nurture, but I think most people agree that the, the two combine to make who we are and determine who we're going to become and all this stuff. Is it all just nature and nurture or is there actually some free will in there? You know, if, if I have this mental illness in my family history, right. And I was also abused, right. So that's nature and nurture. I have the genetic element from the, from the mental illness. I was abused, which is how I was raised. That's my nurturing. If I have those two things, do I stand a chance? Can I, can I break that cycle or am I just doomed no matter what I do? Am I doomed to repeat that and, and be abusive myself? Because obviously that's how things played out with Emma. We see the you know terrifying results of that, the terrible results of Emma becoming a murderous monster, right? So is that is that her fault? Is she making those choices? Was Adora making the choices to abuse her children or is it all just, well, shit, nothing I can do. I, I was abused. So you know I, I'm going to do the same. I'm bound to repeat it. Can you break that cycle? And obviously... On the flip side of that, we see Camille, who who also is abusive, but she's abusive to her, towards herself, right? She never passed it along to anyone else. She turned it inward. She was cutting herself. She was drinking herself to death. She was abusing herself just as Emma abused others. And then what happens with Marion? If, if Marion doesn't die of this sickness, if she lives, does she turn into some sort of monster or something? You, you think she wouldn't be a normal functioning adult, right? Coming from that background. I mean, look what happened to the other two girls. So it's interesting. It's just an interesting thing to think about. The show was brilliant. The, the show had a lot of moments that, that kind of add these, ask these bigger existential questions. I always appreciate that. Just from a straight entertaining point, it, it wasn't boring. It didn't drag. It was a perfectly paced show. The acting was brilliant. The, the way it was shot, um, everything. I, I, this is seriously, I, I don't, I'm not exaggerating. I watch a lot of TV shows. Uh, I've done a lot of, well, I haven't really done that many of these podcasts yet, but I've done a handful of these. So even the shows I've watched, this is the strongest I felt about a show. In, in quite some time you know my favorite all-time shows leftovers i said it a, a bunch of times similar dark elements i can talk about leftovers for days but this was was besides leftovers i think it's the best show i've seen since that that season which granted wasn't you know 20 years ago it was what two three two maybe i think two years ago but yeah it, it wasn't that long ago i understand that but this is the best show i've seen since then i've seen a lot of shows since then so that, that's not a a wasted compliment i loved this show um yeah, and I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. Hopefully, I provided some sort of context for you. I don't know what the next show we're going to be doing is. I remember when I finished Westworld, I had this one in mind. I had Succession. Uh, I'm not sure. I think we're going to be starting a sports podcast, which I know is a sort of different uh, sort of appeal. Like I don't, I don't know if you, if you listen to a television companion podcast, you're also into a sports podcast, or I don't know. I know I am. I think that's why I'm doing them both. So I think we're going to be doing that. If you want to listen to that, try to make it fun. If you are subscribed on iTunes or Stitcher, it'll all be there. Or Laughable. The Laughable app's great for podcast, But it'll all be in one feed. So if you subscribe to The Sorterly, you'll find us there. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel. Give us a thumbs up. Rate, review, subscribe. Well, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast. Give us a, a subscription and you know share the, the YouTube links and 
I think that'll do it. I think that'll do it for the Sharp Objects Companion Podcast presented by The Disorderly. Go to thedisorderly.com for the best in sports and entertainment. Disorderly Media on Twitter. Disorderly ENT on Facebook. Doing a lot more cool stuff in the podcast with you know different members of the team as well. David St. Martin, Andrew Volpe, uh, Ash, who does... <laughs> the Trash with Ash segments are hilarious. I hope they keep doing more of those. I think they're great. Uh, she basically just watches shitty movies and reviews them. Monica's going to get more involved as well. If you listen to the channel, you kind of know the personalities. We're going to keep mixing and matching them and getting some good stuff going. So uh, that'll do it for me. I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you tune in for whatever we do next and just continue to follow and support the disorderly. And I will catch you guys later. Peace, guys.